All right. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being here, being patient. It'll be worth it. Yeah. I'll figure this out. All right, that's good enough. It's up by there. Fashionably late, I guess. <laughs> All right, so we can begin. If I can get this to, there we go. So the real question that we're gonna try to answer today is really why study soil? Because soil microscopy is really just a piece of a whole world. And it's really because it's the linchpin and microscopy could be the linchpin in all this too. But first, let me introduce myself. I'm Matt Powers. I used to be a musician in New York City and LA. And last time I was in Texas, actually, I, I, this is what I was doing at South by South by uh, South by Southwest last time I was here. It was like 2006, so it was a long time ago. <laughs> um, and, and, and I got married and I think it was year two, my wife got cancer and lost her thyroid. And then in the radiation treatment, she got tons of other cancer. And then when I like asked the doctors, they got all weird. And I like lost my trust in my the medical world. And many people have already come to that place. Um, and, and so, and, but it began this like journey of fighting cancer and trying to like figure things out. And me eventually agreeing to leave that job where I was the bass player in a traveling touring band where I literally didn't have to do like anything. I just had to play bass, look good, didn't have to think. Didn't have to think hard. Like, we don't use full vocabulary. The mic. Words I use. And we might need to mute other people. Um, I'm just muting your screen up so we can see you. Oh, I can't mute other people. Anyway. Uh, all right. So come on, work with me. So you guys see the mouse is gone, right? You're with me. All right. It just messes with me. So we moved down west. We had more children. Um, cancer kept coming back, though. I became a teacher so that I could be home more full time. And I stopped touring as a musician. It was like, it was like going and shooting your own dog. That's the best description I can come up with it. Yeah, it's exactly how it was. It's was brutal. I, I like becoming, like leaving the music industry behind because it was all as a child when I was six years old. I wore out my hoot tape. That's all I wanted to do, all I wanted to be. But the crazy thing was when I started teaching, I felt really bad for the kids. I taught in Fresno. More gang members there than LA. I taught in the sixth most violent county in, in America. I felt really bad for the kids. I was like, wow, dude. You got like a great education. Your family had problems, but pff, like this? And I was like, mm, wow. And then I was like, and then you got to have your dream. You did go to tour. You did go all those things. You did all that. But then you got kids now. And so I was like, oh, reality check. And, and I felt like this thing happened to me. And my mom was a teacher. And she wrote the first special ed curriculum for middle school that got adopted into law. And then when she was getting her, her master's degree at Columbia, they tried to teach her to her. And she was like, maybe I should like keep doing this law thing. And so I grew up with her changing the world around me. So my mom created the helmet law for kids in Connecticut when I was in fourth grade. Didn't go over so well with my friends. No longer friends. <laughs> So, but, but I, so I, I grew up not liking teachers, not liking the authority. And then I became a teacher and I was suddenly like, oh, you guys really need like someone here on your side. And so it just opened this door and I can't like pull a teacher out of me. <laughs> it's like who I am. I became this really weird quirky teacher um because i really wanted a safe environment where like all the kids felt like they could be wrong 
in order to learn how to be right. And so I love I love teaching. Um, and I like taught like seed saving and like permaculture in English class at a, a charter school. <laughs> and I got really good at it. And it was because of permaculture, really. And it was it was in crazy, crazy circumstances. OK, so it looked this good, but I'm going to tell you how hot it was because you're like, it's hot here in Texas. But wait, that was all throw. So so I trained the seeds. Really, I trained like I think um, in many ways it was the microbes because they sterilize my seeds that you buy and they're lacking their actual partnerships from the soil that you're trying to plant them in. So when you save seed and don't like clean them or like sterilize them, which who does, you're returning that biology on the seed. So it already knows itself. It's like our microbiome, right? Like when we have that like really bad sickness and then we like or take all those antibiotics and it kills our inner gut and we come out of it feeling like, whoa, I gotta like recalibrate. It's like, yeah, it's because we wiped out our, our part of our identity. So this was all throw so and there's a food forest inside that um, and they're protecting it because it gets a little hot. So you can see the temperatures. This, this is um, an inch or two deep into the soil. And where it was watered, but had no mulch, it was like I was just throwing money on the ground, being like, ha ha. Like, water did nothing, really. I mean, you know, I mean, 115 is not good enough for growing plants. So, so, so I, I, I learned, and this is, you guys are like, oh, that's, that's basic, but cool, right? But like at the time in like 2013, this was like bum, 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 bum. And like in my like local, like small conservative town of like Foothill, California, this was like wild. People were like, you can't do that. You can't, you can't like garden here. And I was doing this all with like without fences. People were like, you need like hot wire, you know, and like <laughs> they were like really serious. And so I kept doing this stuff. And then I was like, Joseph, no water. And then it worked. And I was like, and so I kept doing things that were like impossible because it was clearly possible. And so this is like grown with no water. This is months in. But the thing is, it's red Aztec spinach. So they grew this without watering it, of course. So it had these genes in it, logically, but I'd never seen anyone do it. But that's the thing, it's like, if you guys knew the story behind the thing and you thought about it for a bit, you could do it the same thing. But, the, but only one person had been selling you seeds. It was Carol Depp, author of The Resilient Gardener, seed breeder. So that's why Baker Creek, I was the provider for Baker Creek seeds of those. And those are actually um, not the ones that they sold. Those are part of an experiment. Those ones that in the experiment, the seeds went from white to black. And then I looked up wild seeds and the wild seeds are black. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay. And then it's black, but you know, come on. When we look very close and shine bright light, it's actually red super, super dark red, what is red block? UV, right? So it's like intense sunblock, right? Cause it's like, it's really hot, <laughs> right? So this is what happened when I was a teacher. I, I was kick showing the kids how to do a Kickstarter and I modeled, I was like, you gotta model it. This is good educator, you know? And then it like went through the roof. And so, I turned a, the, a PDC, Jeff Lawton's PDC, into a book with his permission. He had it turned into Arabic. It's gone all over the world. This was years ago. It's in five other languages. And I've written over 20 different books. Um, and this is all I do now. And I've really transformed into a lot of these things In because I was an educator to begin with. I have a master's degree in education. But I became, and I was a family guy. And then I was like a seed guy, but like in the process of learning all those things, I became all those things. 
And that's the thing about permaculture and citizen science and really the world we're entering. It's, it, you can become what you want and you can be transformed by the work that you do. And you can come up with ideas that the community will like fund and it will literally transform you in the process. Like that book right there, Regenerative Soil, that book fundamentally changed me as like, a, like my mind, the way I viewed the entire world, everything. At the beginning, I was terrified <laughs> because it's, it's a complete paradigm change um, from the way we understand the world. But I've been in this process of creating the academic bridge to the regenerative economy so that we actually can make money doing the right thing. Because the, 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 and the, the mycology community is so incredibly amazing at this. When I went to MycoFest, there was like zero like guilt for like making a product and selling it. And in the permaculture world, there's like a little bit of guilt there. They're like, you're making money? How is this okay? And it's like, wait. <laughs> don't you eat? <laughs> they might be breatharians. I don't know. But my point is, is it's like, I was totally, I just fell in love with the pragmatism and the, the, the real science ethic of the mycological community. And if you guys have noticed, um, the past, I don't know, four years, the events I speak at are all mycology events. So I go where I get invited. So um, that regenerative though, regenerative soil, what do I mean by that? It gets better and better over time and it ends itself healing because that's literally what nature does. So when we think of permaculture, it's those ethics and everything, people care, earth care, future care. It's us trying to interact with nature as best we can in a scientific way that allows analysis properly through those lenses. But the adjective is us trying to imitate nature's behavior and character, which is regenerative. So regenerative soil is better and better soil over time and it's self-healing. So why is this important? Well, literally everything on the earth relies upon the soil from the ocean life, like because there's ocean soils, there's four different major ocean soils um, to everything on land. And we all, all of organic matter beings return to soil. We get all of our nourishment from soil. We're made of soil. And, it, and it's the linchpin into all civilization, all permaculture systems. So we're going to be talking about how that relates to soil microscopy today. And so one, we're going to be talking about why soil microscopy matters. And we're going to be talking about how regenerative soil microscopy works. And then we're going to talk about what the future of testing is. Because what I found with my work is like everything's connected to everything. Like that permaculture concept, <laughs> it's true. Like everything is connected. And that's why the generalized interconnected kind of understanding that permaculture brings that lens is so powerful when you apply it to like overlaps of different sciences. And then it's a holistic perspective and today I'll bring something up that I think every time I tell someone it, they go, oh yeah, and then we should do it with this too. And you guys are gonna feel the same way. And I think that it's because it's a concept that is, is very human. It's very community source solution and it's gonna be awesome. So anyway, here we go. And it deals with the future of testing. So why does this all matter? The reality is, is that a lot of people are in this weird, this weird space where they're like, you just need one test or you just need to do this one thing. Oh, you just need this one prep or just watch this one YouTube video. <laughs> no, um, but for real though, like everyone is stuck and that's very human, right? We want things to be easy. We want this, the plot to be somewhat predictable, something new, something old, right, to combine. It's okay, we can forgive ourselves for that, but we can't let ourselves get away with it, right? <laughs> so, so it feels a little bit like, like someone is like thinking like we just need one thing, but it's, we need much more than that. 
because the standard like soil mineral test, I mean, most people are like, hey, that's cool, right? I mean, that's true, right? And it's sort of kind of kind of true, you know, kind of sort of true. Um, the reality is it's true for calcium, magnesium, sulfur, boron, and zinc. This is a slide from one of my courses. So, and the, the, the highlighting in, at the bottom is added um, for us today, because that's what we're going to be focusing on. But the reality is, if you've got soil organic matter, it bends reality. What do I mean by that? It can take on more protons than your CEC can read. So you get your CEC, it says like, this is how much you're like 20 CEC. You're like, well, at least it's not 10. You know, and, and you're like, I can take on this many nutrients, which means without adding any fertilizer, I can grow this many bush bushels of corn, right? That's how they work with CEC. But if you have organic matter, you can hold more protons and nutrients. It creates the ability to have more sites to attach to. It extends off the clay particles. And when you do your, your jar soil test, you'll see that like even like the ones where it's separating out where it's the good soil, the sand is darker in color. Why? Because it's glommed on. You can't quite get it off because it's, it's carbon. You know, it likes to just stick. Um, so, so it's the glue um, among other glues. There's many glues. Um, so it, it's good to tell you what's soluble though, what's flowing, what's going to be slurped up. But it's soluble. Okay. So it's, it's accurate for those things. It's a generalized snapshot and it's good to have a reference point. If you do sap, uh, like plant sap analysis, you're taking the top on the bottom leaf, the oldest and the youngest leaf, and you're doing a ratio test. You're seeing what's actually in the plant. Well, if you correlate it with the mineral test, oh, okay, well, now you know what's actually being taken up. And the thing that you can't see in the mineral test that's being slurped up is in a non-soluble form, but someone is solubilizing it for you. And it also could be the rain. Uh, when we talk about like the Goldilocks pH EH range, you guys, and if any of you guys are in my, my regenerative soil, I'll take questions at the end. Um, in my regenerative soil course, we're like talking about that, like that perfect pH EH Goldilocks zone. Anytime it rains hard, we're like, boom, right? We're reducing, we're shifting out. Anytime the soil really dries out, boom, you're shifting out. So our plants need to be resilient for those events because they happen all the time. So this Goldilocks like region is where they're like, oh, I'm now I can like uptake and take all these things in, but then they shift out of it. And of course, when they're shifted out, like they've got other options too. Sometimes we don't like those options. <laughs> <laughs> um, so should you do it? Yeah, totally. There's nothing wrong with like the, the mineral soil test, but just like understand that their perspective on it is messed up. I mean, that's just the way to put it. Um, I mean, the fact that like Texas A&M, like, um, I don't know much about them other than like this in particular, um, you look up their tests, they're recommended like critical levels of effect for lawn, orchard, garden, policy. Yeah. The only difference was peaches. And then it was like slightly, you know, I was like, why are peaches different from orchard? I could have had an orchard of peaches, you know, so it's like. You gotta, you gotta, we have to apply because in their minds, it's like, this is all you need. And it's like, no. And, it, and that would be a mistake if we did it, I think with any test said, this was all you need. And we'll get more into that. So um, this, is the, this is the outline for the video I put on YouTube. Um, I didn't want to like go over all this today as like, like a rehash, but I wanted to run through it really quick. Um, I want to make this like an information rich kind of experience. Um, so like when we, when we get in there and start this whole process, we're really looking just to see if anything, and we'll do this today. We see if there's any life in there. Then we try to identify who's cycling, like where the nutrients are actually going. And then we, and then Okay, so I'm starting to head more into like my own area, but like with organic matter, I look at it under bright field, which is what everyone else is doing. 
but also dark field because that's when you can actually see their true colors and you can see the striations and you're like that's clearly pieces of wood that are undigested and we'll look at that today too um and then epifluorescence you flip the light on and and you're like da 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 and you're like finding bright bright crystals i didn't do anything to this i mean we can move around later my point is it's like there's no stain there's no prep there's no cover slide on this and i literally can just tell you if it's been fed on instantly by a fungal by, by, by fungi or not instantly so and this is led this is not mercury vapor lamp and it's not going to explode because those explode and they cost thirty thousand dollars it's great to be alive today <laughs> Um, so, so like, and then there's morphological categorization versus identification. I talk about um, it's a it's it's a really important thing to recognize. You cannot ID E. coli. It's not a spiral key. It's not a spiral shape. It's a nondescript bacilli shape. It looks just like the other bacilli. So, and that's that's completely well known, accepted everywhere, everywhere. Um, and and. And you can get special kits that test for specific ones. But the reality is it's there's more than one and and it's much better to do DNA testing. Um, so so morphological categorization is really useful, and we'll talk about that a little bit today. but but identifying them is not what you're doing. We're categorizing, we're narrowing down when we're saying because there's we'll get into that too. There's millions of, of, of different nematodes, for instance. Um, counting and measuring, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about a new method uh, that takes an old stain and it's a cancer malaria medication that um, is a new live dead stain. So we, we haven't had that in the soil microscopy community other than an $800 kit that you can use a few times. But instead for pennies, you can add two to four drops into one milliliter of soil solution and have that be a session for like fractions of a penny or, or, or pennies. I didn't math on that, but I know it's like instead of eight hundred dollars, it's a seventy dollar bottle that literally I dilute twice, and I think that I can provide like everyone, all my students with, and still have enough for the lifetime. Like it's so much because it's it's a powder and it's like a dye, so it goes forever. So anyway. Um, I'll be talking about that. And then epifluorescence microscopy. Um, we talked a little bit about that, but there's a reason why it should be a part of every community lab. It really should be just because of what I just said, but a ton of other things. Um, and it's, it's non-destructive. It's a, it's a root assessment. And then we're going to go over that with grids. And then I want to talk about one other thing. So, um, we talked about that, we talked about that. I'm going backwards. Okay. All right, so that solubility. So when we shift the pH and EH, you unlock things. You, you invariably do. And when you're weathering things physically, you unlock things. But really it's the biology that is going to be the fastest way to release things because the the, the ph and eh shifts it's like there's limitations to that and there's dangers to that we really want to buffer our soil so that it doesn't swing hard and it's really up to the soil food web all the trophic layers of of the soil um, so let's cover quickly how plants get their nu nutrition. Like traditionally, it's the ionic exchange, um, and that's them releasing these protons. But the reality is if they're in alkaline oxidized soil, which we have here, right? Especially where it's like limestone, right? Um, it's going to be oxidizing. And so it'll take four times as much water when you add um, anything that's nitrogen based. And within hours, it turns into nitrate in that soil. So you need four times as much water. Um, and once you're acidic, you're just pumping in energy and energizing the soil more and more over time. So it's really imperative that, and, and pH is the power of hydrogen. So we're talking about moisture levels and it's that simple. 
And it's it's a weird thing that like people are like defending like desertified landscape, being like, no, this is the desert. And it's like in the 40s, they were lamenting the loss of most of the natural habitat and landscape in America. Don't defend this. It was all way wetter. We had surface area of three more states in water because of beavers. Three more states, Nevada, Utah, and Arizona. They're not small. You know what I mean? It's not like we're talking about like Connecticut. So it's an incredible amount of surface water, incredible amount of pH change. And you can just look it up. pH is directly related to your humidity and your climate. Ah, come back. So yeah, they're literally releasing these protons to get these cations and they're displacing them. It looks like like attracts like from like up here, but you zoom down and they're actually displacing them by flooding the soil with protons around the roots. Then it's just part of photosynthesis. So that makes it primary. They cannot help but pump it out. And if it's the wrong soil type, they have to just do hydroxide. And then that kills the soil. Because hydroxide releases carbon from the soil as CO2. So it's primary. And then there's the exudate chain reaction, right? This is uh, what Elaine Ingham has been, has been teaching and sharing for, for decades now. Um, this is what her husband, Robert, her and a team of other individual experts for individual sections of this came together and wrote in, I think, 84 or 86. It's called the, um, uh, the, the, the monologue or, um, anyway. Um, but ecological monogram is what it's called. And so you can look that up. It's R. Ingham, and it, 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 you gotta search for it that way because they, they do abbreviate their names um, and most of their papers are written together. So, which is pretty darn cool. Think about that. <laughs> um, but the thing is, like that seems secondary, right? Because they're getting the exited sugars from photosynthesis. But the reality is there's something before that that happens inside the rise and phagy cycle. So the exited cycle is, 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 is the third layer. Because rhizophagy is actually happening right here. Um, uh, and in order to have um, root hairs, you have to be absorbing microbes and destroying them. So plants are actively eating and destroying microbes. They're like carnivorous, if you will. And this is it. This is, you can see them being expelled. You see that? Pretty epic. We'll go back and forth for a second. This is the root hair. Boom. This is the root hair. Crazy, right? And it's a pumpkin seed seedling. And um, it's not the first time I did it. So what about the endophytes, you might be asking? Um, well, the endophytes, what's really crazy is that they're bombarded with superoxide like everyone else. But then they they <laughs> they they actually combat it. They sent they they turn they they actually release nitrogen. And so what happens is they fix nitrogen, nitric oxide, right? That combines with the superoxide. So the plants like I got free food, and the and the, and the endophytes like and I am still here, right? <laughs> And so, and so this, and like the ethylene is what drives those root hairs. So root hair growth, they've literally sterilized seed, seedlings and had them with no microbes being eaten through rise of aging and then with, and every test they've done, the only way to have root hairs is to have microbes. And this is the primary way that compost tea actually works. Compost tea is mostly E. coli. Commensal, good, endophytic E. coli. And we're also about, there's about to be a bunch of papers released on E. coli. E. coli is like, there's like nine pathogenic E. coli, right? And maybe 12. And there's like millions of species. Perspective, right? Um, so provide nitric oxide or die. Dr. James White, I love it, right? So, you know, 
endophytes entering the root must be able to fix nitrogen. If you're an endophyte and in a plant and you're surviving, you are fixing nitrogen, period. Is there something here? Um, oh yeah, so how regenerative microscopy uh, works. So I've hinted at some of this before, but I wanna start first with like what people are doing right now, what people are looking at and what people could look at. So I'm gonna mix it all up, but I'll point out which is which. Um, because I grab pieces of the future, pieces of the past. I grab parts of my course, like this parts of my course. Um, so this is the stuff that you're like looking at if you're really curious. I mean, a lot of people are like, I just look at tea or I just look at soil and compost. You know what I mean? But the reality is the plant sap has life in it. The plant leaf surface has life in it. The roots have life in it. The root surfaces have lights on it. I mean, uh, life on it. And the thing about this, I could turn up the light from beneath and open up the diaphragm and shine light in natural light. And we could see more things from a natural perspective, but it's a light that's shining down, not from below. For I feel it's from below and it's like, <laughs> like sunlight, like they've never experienced you know, it's like totally alien to them. That's why the nematodes are like, ah, ah, ah. they're like freaking out. You guys have seen this, right? We might today, but they hate it. And, and it's because they don't, they're not used to that. But like, when you put this light on, this isn't a frequency they can actually see. And so it, it's, it's just very, very different. It's, it's really, really fascinating what you can see. Um, so trichomes, those are the hairs on all plants and all of them have nitrogen fixing bacteria in them so far that people, um, Dr. James White is finding. In other words, our plants literally could be, because air is 78% nitrogen, right? Come on. The solutions are right in front of us. I mean, they're like, they've got these like sterilized fields all over like Nebraska and Iowa. They're like, not enough fertilizer this year. <laughs> and meanwhile, it's like they're like, don't know where we'll get the nitrogen. And it's like the irony is thick. They're breathing nitrogen. And, and it can be on their leaves. It can be on their surfaces. It can be on their roots. Uh. And not only that, you're like, well, we can't just bring just tons of nitrogen. It's like, okay, well, um, every form of nitrogen that we have, we can pass through biology and make amino acids and then make it even easier for them to be absorbed and used because they get energy from that rather than spend energy transferring them into amino acids. So speaking of those, those hairs, this is the pumpkin hair. <laughs> Not the, not the root, root hair. This is the pumpkin hair on the actual, the trichome. Like the spikes, you know, those, those white, like spikes that just jet out and they're soft. You can just crush them easily. Oh, what's inside? Look at that. Fungi in tons of life is inside there. And you know, the really crazy thing is red. Red is photosynthesizing. So like their hairs themselves have photosynthesizing apparatus in them looks like, but it doesn't look like it's spread out on the surface like a leaf. If I show you a leaf, it'll be like red and like dot, like there's cool little patterns all over it, right? Because it's red, it's photosynthesizing. And that's why you see algae that way too. You get out algae, it's like really cool in the bright fields, bright green, but then you flip on this and it's dark red really cool but that's photosynthesizing in their hairs but it's not complete it's it's yeah yeah it's like almost like um flowing which does this mean that like if we start assessing these more broadly and we see unhealthier plants that they're full all the way because i did this in a jar like a little dish with water and, 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 and microbes in, in like basically like with a little bit of compost because I wanted it to be able to be like come off, come away 
with nothing on it very well so that I could view it easily. But what if like we could measure plant health by snipping a leaf and then the hairs on the stem of the leaf, you look at this and then we put a grid up and you're like, oh, well, root hairs are 40% inoculated. That's clearly a sign of it being immune to this, 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 and this. Right. So, but, but those kind of correlations um, can only be mapped in certain situations that we'll talk about later. So quantitative, how many ratios, you know, with your grid, with, uh, with a grid or not. Um, some people don't use grids. Some people use grids. Um, we'll be covering that. Staining, counting. There's computer counting now. You just submit like little snippets of video and they count. But they're counting like, like ciliates or like just E. coli or something. It's like very tame. So it's not tame. So, so they're getting there, right? We can see what's going to happen. We can, we, we're, I mean, we only need someone to care about it enough to do it because it's possible now. Um, and, and the thing is, all this is prone to error, even the computer counting. And the qualitative, which microbes, who are they? And then the ratios, microbe types. Um, from DNA testing, I can tell you that there's a top 10 and their ratios, I think, matter. And the ratios change depending on a, a bunch of different factors. But they're the same microbes, streptomyces, bulkholder. By the way, all the rhizobias are actually saprophytic. So they're in your compost already. Um, and this is, um, yeah, and so this is also prone to error as well. Um, so timing all this too, people are doing this exact on Zoom together because savvy farmers have gone to two certified labs and given them the same sample and gotten that back totally different answers. And so the labs were like, well, we'll do it together live. And they're like doing the arm together. And then they look under and they're counting and they're like, ready? Uh, uh, and their answers are still totally different. Same exact place, same exact sample. Um, kind of begs the question, why aren't we sharing our answers and making things transparent, right? And, and like, because there's, there's something more here to learn. It's, and, and that's what science is, right? And empowering all of us to actually dig together to make something more possible. That's why like Dr. James White shows you exactly what his protocols are. Like he literally shows you when he publishes a paper and does his whole thing, everything's in there. It's like, you take this much hydrogen peroxide, you take this and you're like, wow, you, I could just follow along and then copy. And yeah, you can, it's unbelievable. But that's literally what science is supposed to be, right? Yes. Right, yes. So um, all the counting is just mowing the lawn. You're just going up and down or there's random. People sometimes do it randomly and then you guess you can trust it randomly. Um, but yeah, so bacteria counting, um, usually it's done with grids or hemicytometer hemis slides. Um, and then you basically have a formula that comes with your grid and you calculate it to the, this, this is funny, but this is like for goats in their milk. And so you, like people are actually like um, checking their milk um, and this is, same same. It's no different from what people are doing in labs everywhere. In fact, there's just principles around the medium you're using and you can tweak it to whatever medium you're doing. And there's principles for all these tests because we want people to create new tests and try different things. Right? I mean, like that's the whole point. Um, wait, come back. Um, so there's no single method exists for undertaking an absolute microbial count using culture dependent methods or even culture independent methods. So plate counting in, a, in like a controlled Petri dish doesn't even work. It controlled all the variables, purified, still no. That's cool. <laughs> so bacteria identification, you can do the shape, how it moves, how they group, the color, you can do stains um, and you can see how they grow. 
uh, and you can do some reactions with them, but, but you're characterizing them. You really cannot identify bacteria with a microscope. It's really important to recognize that. You just can't. You can't tell pathogens from, I mean, you, you just can't. Um, and, 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 and then there's the limits of resolution, uh, uh, resolution, and then there's the limits of even electron microscopes. Electron microscopes, they're coating everything with a spray of palladium and gold. Not real. Like, they're like, like, they, like that's, that's, a, that's a, again, an image that they're capturing. They have infrared microscopes that they're saying they can see indicators before they can actually visualize the bacteria and fungi underneath the microscope. What does that mean? Where is the bacteria coming from? Are they, they're smaller than we can visualize them, right? That, that's what that means. And so like when you are messing with a microscope and you go to a thousand X, you guys know you're at the limit, right? Anyone who tries to sell you a 2000 X microscope is like playing a fun little game <laughs> because a thousand X is the limit of resolution by physics and law. You can't go past that. You're zooming past that. You're just zooming. That's cool. That's why you get the 4K. You get good zoom, but it's not higher resolution. You can't change that. So there's limits to what we can actually see. And you're at a thousand and we're like dialing it in as tight as possible. And you're like, what's that spec? <laughs> there's a spec here. And you're like, it's moving. It's so tiny. And you don't know what it is because it's too small to even know. And so, and, and, and these are like fresh samples. And I know that like, if you dry things out, things shrink, right? And then when you do the agar like flame and then like, guys, it's crazy what they're doing like in a lot of universities. They're like, first we adhere with the agar. Next we flame. The agar is affixed. Now we bathe it in chemicals. Now we assess for life. And it's like, whoa. It's like, where did someone like take your brain out? Like, what point did that begin? That's my phone. James, could you uh, fix that alarm? Is it 5.55? She's gone. All right. Um, so what's crazy is... I got 800,000 reads on much less than a gram of soil. I think it was 0.5 or 0.25 milligrams. So it's 2005, 2006, it's okay. They didn't have good technology then. I'm not kidding. We have the ability now to not PCR. We have the ability to go direct with nanopore sequencing. The problem is, is that cracking bacteria's DNA is totally different from cracking fungi. Fungi doesn't like to like reveal itself very easily. Um, but there's, there's a lot of things being worked on right now to make that easier. Um, and I'm gonna be doing the magnetic, well, uh, we'll table that for now. I got an email this morning that complicates things, but nanopore. They're working on things, they're working. I don't know if the, the magnetic bead prep I already did was already redundant because I've been doing bead prep, but, but the bead cleanup happened at a different point in the DNA extraction. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. All right, anyway, if you follow William Padilla Brown and I was like nanopore DNA sequencing stuff, there's a step that we did, but there's a step later that looks like it's part of that step that you do again with purified salt that is back ordered and very difficult to get in the US right now. I don't know why. Um, and I hope that fixes the issue because if it doesn't, James White was right. Um, because so few of these species have been described, researchers have been uh, have to group similar organisms within operational taxonomic units, which correspond roughly, but not precisely to species designations. This is 2008. 
So this is morphological identification, the stuff that is being taught currently, the stuff that people are doing. And it, it works, but we have to put like a margin of error on it and then a cap on what it can mean for us in terms of decision-making. And then we have to combine with other things to get correlate better understanding. Because it's roughly, right, it roughly corresponds. I mean, think about this. Some nematodes release bacteria from their bodies that kills corn borer worms that are giant in comparison. How do you ID that? Remember, the bacteria is just like all over everything. And they all look alike for the most part. So, um, yeah, it's an issue, but we get solutions, uh, especially for the bacteria. The bacteria side is easy. Um, these are our diazotrophs. These are our phosphorus solubilizers, a bushel mycorrhizal fungi, et cetera. These are categorized by function and form. We're only using, like literally, a buscular mycorrhizal fungi. Let's take it apart. Our buscule, it's a tree shape. It looks like a tree when you get up close and you do and you do their crazy destructive stain practice. <laughs> I don't know if it does that picture perfectly when you don't. Isn't that weird? So again, the way we test influences the perception, influences the assumptions, even influences the names. And yes, it branches into there, but it doesn't quite look like that. So, um, and we can look at that together. Um, so, but, but it's function and form and it's okay for humans. When we're teaching babies, we're like, that's red. That's a ball. That's a circle and a square. And that's exactly how we begin. And that's okay. But wouldn't it be nice to flip to the back of the book and check the answers? That's, that's, that's what I'm talking about. So the sizes change over, size, uh, over time as well. So that complicates things. And they're also such the thing as horizontal gene transfer which opens the door to so many possibilities. I've talked a little bit about this, then a little bit of like uh, just uh, ideas on, on YouTube about that. Because um, the thing is that it really, I've got to, anyway, we'll get into that. Pathogenic versus beneficial cannot be, de be determined. Um, you can't determine it with a microscope. That's why it's so incredibly important that um, compost companies are doing DNA testing as they do, and they should. And, and that's why, you know, catalyst uh, bio, uh, bio amendments, they're awesome. And they, they, they test everything for those pathogens. I, I did a full spectrum test on their things and it was the most incredible thing because guess who's in there? Um, all of EM. So good compost actually always has all of those facultative, used to be called anaerobic microbes, all of them. So don't believe anyone that says hot composting is good and EM is bad. Hot composting is EM. So that was cool to find out. And then the fact that like, 40 to 50% of everything decomposed is E. coli. That was crazy. And then you start looking into it and you're like, wait, 40% of everything's like unidentified too. Wait, DNA can take up to millions of years to break down, theoretically. In order to do a DNA testing, we have to do series of batteries of caustic attacks in order to get just bacteria to give up its DNA. This is all day long, all day long. And then we're shaking and we're like putting magnetic beads and we're going crazy to just get the DNA out. The world is covered with fragments of DNA and our bodies and the microbes all around us are absorbing the DNA from their environment constantly to actually calibrate themselves. They are the sensory organs for our microbiome as they are for the plants. And EM, uh, this is pro-EM. In order to make it edible, they brew each, each microbe independently and then combine it when they bottle it. You can drink this. What does that mean? 
It's the same microbes that are the endophytes in the plants that are biofertilizers and decomposers. They are the, the actual loop of communication between ourselves and the environment around us. That's what this is. It's crazy. And E. coli is the main one. And of course, pathogenic E. coli is not good. And we should start paying way more attention to that because a variety of reasons. People who aren't doing good compost are training it to survive the heat. By doing a little bit of heat, almost, almost, almost. Eh. The microbes are like, okay, I think I can do this. Shigella, Salmonella, E. coli, they're learning. We have, so we have to get hot if we're doing compost. Or do what the companies do, finish it off with worms because they literally remove within two to three weeks all the pathogenic E. coli. Crazy, right? So, so I know that like we don't want worms to go and kill like the temperate northern forests, right? Right. We all know about this. But we literally like are kind of like reliant upon them. Like they're like way more important than we realize. They're the safety valve. And this is why like Catalyst Bio Amendments, they're, they're Elaine certified. That's why they do it. Johnson Sue combine it, and they're also doing it. It's it's incredible. And it's something that a student had actually told me in one of the iterations of one of my courses. And I went and looked it up, like you're looking it up. And I was like, oh my word, he's right. And it was like this huge relief. I was like, cause I was like, that sounds cool. We're live. I'm like, that sounds good. I, I hope it's true, you know? And it's like, it is. But of course, keep our thinking caps on because it's when it goes through the worm and comes out as a casting. If you have a medium, is it all being done perfectly? Yeah, maybe over time, if you're really good and have them process it and move it around and feed them and stuff. But again, we should test to actually know that we're verifying that we're doing these things well. Just because it can happen that way, doesn't mean that you might have a limiting factor in your compost that prevents that from happening. Just, I mean, think about this. If you're missing molybdenum in your soil, you don't fix nitrogen, period. So nutrients are limiting factors because they're actually electrical combinations and their, uh, their charge unlocks the reaction and is part of the reaction. So if they don't have that, there's nothing else that goes and fits that exact combination. It's, a, it's a literally a mineral, you know, in that form even, right? There can be different pH, EH, corrosion chart, core base chart, you know, forms. So, <clears throat> sorry, tangent. Um, so, there's new testing methods, new ways to ID things. Um, fungal hyphae counting. This is what fungi looks like. Um, well, we'll go back. We're going to get closer on this one in a second, but you can already see that there's these segments. Ideally, you want it to be like dark, like that. Um, that's how much you want to see um, per field of view. And that's how you measure how thick they are. Use the bacteria as your point of reference. But again, it's a guesstimate, complete guesstimate, because bacteria come in different sizes. But there's other ways around that. Fungal characterization and measurement. So um, you're in there, you're checking it out. Maybe you throw up a grid. That's from a, a hemocytometer. Um, and then you can actually, like you're here in Keynote, you draw a line and then you take that line and you move it. You, I mean, you make sure to lock it, right? Um, and you just move it. And you can even do a shape if that's easier to lock because you can actually lock those easier, I believe. You can do a shape and actually draw it uh, like a, a, the square. You can turn it into a rectangle and draw it as a line, but that'll allow you to grab the corner of it and hit shift command. I taught at a Mac certified school, forgive me. Um, and then you can rotate it from there and hit. And if you hold shift, it'll go to the 90 degree angle each time. 
So then you can put that that up against the line and you know exactly exactly how long it is. Um, I want to see if we can get down even 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 finer. I don't know if those things exist though. Um, there's other measure like you'll see on this when we look through this, there's measurements on there, but you have to calibrate it in order for those measurements to be correct. So grade the salt. Um, so you look for uniform septa, if it's all funky town, it's not good. If it's like spastic and like really funky, that's an site most likely, and that's not good. It's a water mold. That means that you've overwatered and like got anaerobic conditions probably. Um, but if it's like clear and it's a little funky with the shape, look on one end for a spore. Because when they come out of spores, they often look like young umacytes. Um, so darker is better, straight, not crazy. Um, and, and that's a generalization. Everyone who's doing this has books. They've got identification books or, and they're using um, uh, the irregular fungi. Um, uh, I can't remember the name right now, um, but they're using keys. Everyone is using keys. And that's, the keys are like publicly available. Like the, um, I don't remember the mycology name, but it'll come back to me. Usually things come back to me. Um, so this catalyst biomimics compost. Um, you can see the spores. See, see them there. You're counting. And this is a thing that like you, what's going to happen is like the AI is going to do this for you. And then you're going to check off. Yes, no. You're going to be able to zoom in and check off. Yes, no. Make it a lot easier for you as an assistant. And then there's, again, visual IDing. Um, and you can isolate a lot of, some spores are large enough to isolate. Um, they literally do this. They isolate spores. Um, this is someone's job. <laughs> um, and then they like ID them and, and genetically test them for purity. Um, and there's visual keys online, uh, but, but it, it also can be difficult. And so it's better if we create something more rigorous than just the keys that are available. And I'll get into that in a little bit. So these are not nematodes. These are pinworms. Um, and so it's really important to, um, to, to be able to ID things, but also um, to, to have grain, grains of salt and understand that like these things are complicated. And I'll get into that in a second. So this is what we should have. You'll see them easily. You'll find them easily. We'll probably find some today. Um, this is the drawing and it's like designed to be non-offensive, I believe. Um, and I based originally like mine off of it. Um, the thing is um, the stylet on the root feeder is rather phallic. Um, and I'm not just talking about like, like skyscraper shapes or anything. I'm talking about all of it. Um, and so yeah, if you will see something bad on there, it'll have these two round circles on the bottom of it. And you will know it's different from others. <laughs> it looks characteristic. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, this is like the polite way of, of, of introducing that. Um, and it's just to get you started. Um, the reality is it's like, it's much better to look at a um, series of exact images of the thing that you're looking at rather than um, doing a key and rather than doing um, that visual. But to start with seeing those visuals that are, are idealized can really help us kind of like look for what's important. Because really that was like the esophagus, the mouth and the stylet and the tooth and the lips. Those are what we're looking at. Um, nematode hybridization is like a real thing. They think root knot nematodes literally came to be because of us. And if you look at the genetics of like oomocytes, actinomycetes, um, the reason actinomycetes, actinobacteria, looks a little bit like fungi, looks a little bit like oomycetes is 
they took genes from both. Crazy, right? But it's a grab bag. Why wouldn't they? And fill that niche. It's crazy. But this is how everything works. And that's why when you create a niche, the microbes seem to show up. They're not. They're switching out their, and they have slots, right? They have a number of slots they can switch in and out on their, on their, on their, on their genome. And they're literally dumping genes and taking up new ones from the environment. This is why a, a, an anaerobic pathogenic disease causing environment is a legitimate concept. So things are complicated. Um, there's over a million species. Some people say two to three, a million. Um, we've identified 0.01%. And this was 2020. It's pretty, pretty cool, right? We know very little. We're just beginning. In other words, everyone can get involved. And there's like a reason why um, everyone's inviting everyone in. Like James White literally taught me so much, like way more than any other teacher. Like, I mean, Elaine Ingham taught me like back in the day, like one-on-one, -on -one, so much stuff. But I got to the point where I, I like, I, I, she was like, the rest is in my course, you know what I mean? And I, there's a disclaimer on our course and I'm not gonna violate any disclaimers or do anything like that. I, I respect her and worked with her for many years. Um, but I wanted to learn more and be able to share it and teach it transparently without you know, crossing any wires, making anyone uncomfortable. So I went to the university route, the medical route, the biological route. I studied everything I could find online. I got a subscription to, to Nature, downloaded every single thing they ever, because you I mean the subscription runs out. But if you pay for the printer, you know, you can buy all these things. So like when you come to my house or like my, my, my lab house now, um, there's just these like white folders that are like thick and they're just full of printed paper and they're organized in the subject. So I literally take the, like all of my knowledge and I make sure that it's out and organized so I can go back to where I found things. Because otherwise they're like, where did you figure that out? And I'm like, well, it's a combination of these five things. And then I'm like <laughs> grabbing them. Right now I'm in boxes. So it's like, it's like therapy to unbox actually. Cause I'm like, and here's this part of my brain. <laughs> yeah, I found my two copies of uh, Radical Mycology today. I was like, oh, um, he signed both of them. Oh, dang. All right, I'll hurry up. All right, so um, classic morphology-based identification has proved insufficient to the study of nematode identification and diversity. So we got to do something different. Um, do you guys know that um, pinworms autofluoresce on their hairs? I discovered this. I haven't found anything indicating that anyone has ever seen this before anywhere. And I think it's because they're feeding on fungal feeders. This is huge. This thing is huge. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, and I think that the things inside are ciliates. Um, so protozoa counting, we're back to this. Um, uh, there's amoebas, flagellates, and ciliates, testate amoebas. Amoebas, they're see-through blobs that like shells um, quite often if they're testate. Um, flagellates, they got that tail on there. So all of this is, it, I mean, you guys can see, it's not, it's, it, it's just this identification. It's not that hard. You guys can do all this. And root testing, throw grids on there. This is a combination of the two different images. So it's this image and that image combined so that it's lighter and creates definition. Again, image, we're, we're, we're playing with things to get uh, more deep meaning out of it. So you could literally set things up and then count those grid uh, against itself to create a ratio or percentage. Um, and I, um, well, we'll talk about that later. So um, you can examine rhizophagy this way. You could examine exudation this way and endophytes this way. Stains really help a lot. Um, soil minerals, dark field's the bomb. 
This is dark field. Can you guys see that that's wood? See the, the, the sections? It's, it's cellulose, clearly. But do you see how that's wood? See the lines going across? This is biochar. This is poorly burned biochar. <laughs> Undigested wood. So, so what's the difference between what I'm doing? I combine all those things. I do epifluorescence. I do dark field on top of, of bright field. Um, but it's not just that. The thing is, um, we need to, to combine all those things. We need to do different kinds of assessment from different angles. Um, I'm going to talk about what uh, my solutions to all of this. Because the reality is, is that folks need to learn how to do this and then do it in front of each other, transparently, so to speak. Maybe not exactly in front of each other. It might be a little awkward. Um, but we'll do it here in a second. Um, so, so I created an online course and a new book. And it was supposed to be Kickstarter today, but they haven't approved me. So I'm in the limbo waiting game, um, wanting approval, um, uh, feeling floor team. No, um, but, but this is what I'm doing. And I combined it with a database. I've done books and I've done courses. I know how to do that. That's like what I do. But the, what I realize is that you have the skills and many of you have, have the skills to add to the conversation at the same exact level or more niche to your level, like, like higher level in the niche space that you occupy than me or any of the other experts I've encountered because it's such an open field. I know of only one other person with this. I mean, Ellen W. Scientific's Mike Thomas wrote me and asked permission whether he could offer to like connect me with Elaine Ingham so that I could teach her how to use this. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I know her, <laughs> you know, and, and but, but like, that's the thing is it's like, it's that wide open a field that someone who wrote a paper on this technology, the initial technology in the eighties, she wrote a paper on it in 81 is still learning and growing. It's science. We're all still learning and growing. The technology is changing everything. That's, that's good, that's great, it's awesome. But it also opens the door to everyone participating. And that's really what we need. Because, well, because like I talked about earlier, those two certified labs that had completely different answers and were embarrassed publicly by this farmer. And then the, they tried to do it in front of each other and then they were doubly upset because they couldn't get the same results. And so when I was talking to them, they were like, you have to make sure that everyone knows that things can be wrong. And I'm like, I know, I know. So, so like, 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 like every test has caveats, but the only way that we actually know if tests have caveats and strengths is to compare them against other tests. So we need to have a new kind of testing and we need to also test and share our results in front of people and compare it to other people's test results to get better interpretations. So I wrote this book. It's part of the Regenerative Soil Trilogy. What I realized as I was writing the second edition for this was that I need to redo microscopy altogether with more realistic ideas and assumptions built around it, as well as new testing methods that connect to other tests. When was the last time you guys pH'd your compost before you used it? Oh, do you know the nitrogen levels of compost? Do you know what happens when you add too much nitrogen? It makes your plants disease prone, right? We know this, right? Compost is usually ridiculously high in nitrates. Ridiculously high. And remember how much water nitrates require? Four times as much. So there's lots of this. And, and the thing is, I keep saying things and people are like, wow, blah, blah, like in my courses and somewhat on YouTube, but it's like, I'm like, hit, it, there's like a huge wall on the way when an individual just says things. And I have an audience, I love teaching. I love my audience. I love my students. I love the courses that I have and the communities that I have. They're like, they're the internet to me. 
they're like my safe space on the internet because everyone's really kind. It's like 2007 there. It's really wild. Um, but, but like, this is going to change everything if we actually can all participate and meaningfully get recognized. So I realized that A, I had to write a whole book on DNA to expose how DNA actually works. Um, and so I wrote this book uh, and I'm write, writing the DNA book at the same time, but, but that'll come next year. I've got to do a lot of interviews of like geneticists because I have, every time I research, I come up with like twice as many questions. So, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing this and then we'll get to, to the DNA, but like, it's, it's really simple. The microscopes and supplies you need, morphological guide, and the links to all the keys. But again, they're limited. We need a better solution. We need to actually be able to see what other people's interpretations are with actual pictures and video, because that builds our actual, our actual lens and, and our actual fluency. So, and then test rubrics, test protocols, and then case studies showing examples of like how they actually look and work so that you can, so that you, when you're filling it out, you can make it look like mine. That's, that's how I always began with, with whenever I did anything um, as a kid. And um, so anyway, and the best test methods to pair with regenerative soil microscopy. This is the jump off. If we start combining tests, we expose weaknesses, strengths, and truths, caveats and conditions that have never been exposed before. So these are excerpts from the book. Um, these are just from the section. So the actual, like you can see that predatory nematode top left there, that chunk, that open space, it, it literally just attaches and then just starts taking apart. Anyway, uh, too much. Um, hemocytometer, these things are the bomb. I didn't bring mine because it's $150. Um, and it, they're really, 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 really um, finely tuned instruments. And so you don't want to scratch that because that is like a speck on there. So um, this is actually the stain on the right there is that stain that I um, basically repurposed. It was a stain that um, wasn't in the same wavelength as this, but I realized, hey, <laughs> We've got monitors. I mean, you'd blind yourself. You put. I, I warned Brian vague when I told him how to do this. Um, I, I told him not to put his eyes on there because you'll blind. I don't use these, by the way. This is terrible for your eyes. Like, don't use these. Get them. Get them. Get a get a screen for real. It is really literally worth it. And it's all a computer screen, so you can just connect to any computer screen. Um, before I had this, I just used my regular computer screen. So I have a new book, of course, and a database. And the database is really the thing that will change everything. So if we have the ability, um, and this is the course, I'm gonna have visual how-tos, live Q&A, live demos, certification, and one year access to the database um, and lifetime access to the community and the course materials. So I have an online um, circle thing. It's like Facebook from 2007, except with all uh, anyone else in it. So it's like got like and like photos and videos and like, that's it. And it's just you and your folks. It's amazing. So, um, and, and, and I've, I've got toolkits that, that, that'll come with the course, um, but the, the database, if we combine all of these different data points and if you break these out, it's, I mean, if you actually did, if we got the, the DNA to the raw sequencing instead of you entering the top 10 or top 50, um, I mean, it could be hundreds of thousands of points of comparison, but I'm going to keep it initially to just over a hundred points of comparison. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to have it so that like you could do deep, deep research with this because the reality is it's so darn simple to create a database. We're just entering in simple information, you know? So, so the bioregion, you'll be able to search across your bioregion, compare your soil to your bioregion. I mean, wouldn't that be cool to know like how you're doing compared to everyone else in your bioregion? It's, and, and then you're like, holy cow, my site is like the best in the bioregion. Someone's gonna have that, you know, at some point. 
Um, and then, and then like moisture levels, compaction, the bricks of the plants growing in the soil. How about we start correlating these things? Um, like I said, the DNA is how we're going to really check on these things. And if the DNA actually is going to show you what I think it's going to show you, the ratio differences per different soil, per different growing environment is going to be everything. And then we can tailor it for secession. We can tailor it. Oh, it's going to be awesome. And we could also time it. Because the reality is when we have like six months of like gestation of a compost pile or a year gestation, there's a spectrum of change. So snapshotting those changes and then knowing, oh, at the six month point, it actually has these microbes in it different from 12 months. So this is actually an application for vegetative growth rather than reproductive. So all these things open up and yeah, time of day, year, season, moon cycle of sampling. If, if the moon affects the tide um, and people argue about what else it affects, right? Um, and the phloem and the xylem, right? What does it do to the microbes? They're sensitive as heck. So, I, I, and I know that like someone would be like, that's out there. And I'm like, okay, then we disprove it. Win, win. But this is the only way we do it. Because otherwise we're going to get trust meta studies. You guys seen these meta studies? Like, oh, we studied 10,000 studies. The AI did it for me. <laughs> and, and we figured out this and it's like, yeah, but you don't know how jacked up those studies are. And so the only way is to be thorough and transparent. And I don't know if you guys surf much in the literature, like in the microscope, microscope world, they don't show their work. They give you a chart. They're like, and there were this many. And you're like, mm, I don't know if I believe you. Let me see your picture. Or their pictures are like, like, like a two-year-old did them. And you're like, you can't see anything in this. And it's like all blurry. And you're like, what university is this? And then it's like a major one. And you're like, what's happening? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. And so like, this is the thing, it's like, I was writing this and I felt A, exposed because I'm poking at people's conclusions and methodologies, but isn't that what science is supposed to be? Right, a continuum of trying and testing things out and being like, oh, that's surprising and new. I'm eager to learn more because I didn't know that before. And it's like, why isn't that the normal thing? Instead, it feels like there's a lot of, weird to tack vibe online. And it's like, I want to end that. I want like the mycology community is the, is one of the best communities I've ever been part of because they're so warm and like encouraging and welcoming. And they're like, Oh, that's your idea. That's a great idea. I've never heard of that idea. Yeah. You know, everywhere I go, East coast, West coast, South doesn't matter. Awesome. And like, that's the things that's I'm like, yeah, why don't we just be open-minded and community solutions source all the problems. And, and meanwhile, like I show this to like engineers and they're like, yeah, and then we do this for food. And I'm like, oh, okay. Because you know, the microbes are in the food too. And then we do our gut biome. And then we, and then we start connecting all of this. And then the data itself, when things are self-evident, it's, we should move on. But when things are self-evident, it's like the sun dawning. You can't hide. They can no longer hide. So. Attention earthlings, the library will be closing in 25 minutes. We got this. Five minutes, the library will be closing. We got Go this. Go back to your home planet. Bye-bye. <laughs> Only in Austin, right? <laughs> um, so like, you're like uncertain about this, right? But if you go and see other people's assumptions, see how the community rated those, those, those entries, you start building a fluency. So that's really what I want to do. I want to be able to be able to compare their soils to their own soils over time. Because um, how is cataloging all the pictures and information you gather? Is that, is that fun? I, yeah, don't, not working out great. <laughs> it's, it, it is the most overwhelming thing in the world. Yeah. I have like, I think, like seven hours of raw video. 
And like, I try to label it and put it in folders. And then I'm like sweeping through videos and like finding things. It's so awful. But if I was, every time I did it, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to idea and then enter it into the database and do all these other tests. It's going to actually give me the meaning that I'm after. And at the same time, it's going to put it into an organized set of data that I can reference other things to and then reference to itself later on. So you can get over that hump of doing the work, but then it's also like actually navigable because it's like, I've tried different things of organizing it, but it's so much. It's like, well, how many nematodes do you have? Okay. You know, and it's like, it's, it can get endless very quickly. Cause remember we've only characterized or identified 0.01% of the nematodes. You know what I mean? We're there, we're there, we haven't begun. So, so it's like really important that we have those kind of um, ability to compare conclusions, to compare interpretations, to be vulnerable, to make mistakes, to get community feedback, and to be in an environment that encourages people to explore, discover, discuss, learn, and grow, and, and, and really have that lead. Because this is, this is where we're at. Um, uh, we really are at the beginning. So we're gonna see shortcuts for farmers and gardeners. We're gonna see new methods. I already have seen new methods for composting, I already seen new methods for compost teas. I'm demonstrating on my channel. Um, new recipes for management practices and new microbes and application styles. So it's not launched yet, they didn't approve me. So hopefully tomorrow. Yes, we're rooting for you. Thank you. Um, so, so help me out with that if you can, if you guys remember that. <laughs> um, it'll be around, I'll put, put links around, I'll promote it and all, but um, yeah, I'd hope to be like really like suave and like, here's the link. And it's like, da, 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 we're in, but no, no, that didn't happen. But I still want to tell you about it because I think it's like the most pertinent thing that we can do is to like flip the light switch on the situation and start talking about what's actually happening. And I mean, that's what the mycology community literally does. They're like, this is the identification group. This is the fungal sequencing group. And they flip the lights on. Um, so share this with folks that you know will love it. And um, I know that there's, they're the, 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 the folks that wanted to be here that weren't, and there's probably not very many other people, <laughs> but you know those people that love soil, love compost. So um, do you wanna like get into this? Yeah. Okay. All right, um, let's turn that off. Let's switch. Um, let's switch to this. And I'm going to take away these roots and just um, go over here and grab these roots. Okay, do you wanna do that for me? Yeah. Okay. I want you to stay down for me. Right, I'm gonna break you. Okay. So um, let us travel a bit. All right. You can see some interesting stuff there. So my condenser is completely shut. Um, must be showing the screen now on here or no. Okay. Then I'll just. Um, so, but you could probably camera. put that like there or, or perhaps. Um, I'll use my. Okay. It's not going to be forking on me. <laughs> All right. Um, here, let me just um, go like this. Perhaps that will help. Um, so like really quick though, like let's just like move around here for a second. Um, so I just like tore that apart. Move around. You can see some fungal evidence there. I wanted to just dive in now. How close can I get without being obstructive? There we go. So that right there. Right there. 
That right there. All right, so I don't have a cover slip on, but I like doing that because you actually can see things way better, um, especially with roots. Do you guys see these shining um, little crystals? Those are phosphorus and calcium. So fungi creates those crystals because they release digestive enzymes. And those digestive enzymes um, make phosphorus soluble, but then it's these ions that are just floating around, so they take shape. And so that's fungal evidence on this grass from outside. Um, who are you over here? Ooh, look at that blood red, Did you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's photosynthetic. And do you see how, um, Mm -hmm. I don't want to get my lens dirty, <clears throat> but do you guys see how they're like, they're like chunks of glass? Mm -hmm. That's the thing is it doesn't look this way when we switch, like watch. I got to turn this on. Ah, that's a reveal there too. Um, the fact that I had to um, I turn on the thing. I turn off the entire base because otherwise like, there's still light. So that's like, again, like a photo, right? So I'm all the way up. Where's that image? Right? Even that isn't right. It was up higher. So it's this. Can't really see it. And where's that excess light coming? It's to chaos. We can adjust this a little bit, but even that, it's creating a chaos because the light's coming from below when we really want it to come from above. And that's the thing, it's, it's, it's a fundamental change. Altogether, it's a complete change with how we're actually getting to visualize things. And it's safe, there's no mercury vapor in here. This is like a huge breakthrough. LNW Scientific um, offers this. My students get a 40% discount um, on all microscopes through them. Uh, I, 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 we word, word, and then there's other things that we might do. Like I might do a discount on hemocytometers through them too. Um, but yeah, it's really, it's really just a different world when you can see it that way. That right there, up here. Hmm. Look at that. Fungal inoculation. See how it's like webbing? How it's going around? And then there's a hair. These are root hairs. That fungal strand, look at that. But the root hairs, so there's some in the tip, that there's fungi in the tip of that root hair. You can go closer if you put a slide cover on, because then you'll protect your, your 400X. But 400X is like your workhorse, and so you kind of want to protect it. So this is just, we're just looking at grass here. Let's pull that out. Um, let's look at a leaf. This is the, this is the leaf. This is yeah. So, so, so the leaf surface. Look at that. Wow. Do you guys uh, see the fungi? It's so easy to see the fungi, isn't it? Yeah. This is non destructive. No stains, no cover slip, no prep. I threw it underneath there. The thing is, I know it's an expensive microscope. It's LED. My son kept it on his lap as we drove here. <laughs> Imagine if children in, in schools had something like this, where they literally could be like, wow, fungi glows in the dark. And this is the, the, the frequency that nematodes see at. And then all fungi create glows. So that means that literally microbes are following the, gro the glow towards where the food is. Mm -hmm. what, what is the magnification at Western? Oh, this is only, um, only 100x. 
Um, What's yeah. the price on this? I have some extra things um, that I use with it, but I think it's um, I think it's like four thousand with a discount. I think I always have to check numbers on things. That's my one weakness. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so we can very easily see, and then like you can open the, um, the condenser more and let in the natural light in the room. If you want to get better at characterizing, um, things like if you wanted to like do a count or something, but yeah, it's pretty stunning when you just start to get really acquainted with it. And yeah, all that is fungal. All the leaf hairs are covered in fungi. And that's a really cool profile, actually, because you can see how, um, like, the phosphorus. Sorry, guys, you're going to go back to the bigger Yeah, OK. Thank you. Thank you. Are we wrapping it up? All right. Well, thank you so much, Matt. That was so cool. That was so